And our first reading is from the Psalms, a psalm of thanksgiving for God's eternal love. And Julia will read that psalm. And then after that reading, we turn to Romans. Paul's letter to the Romans, we continue. We've got to chapter 12. Paul spent uh, three chapters exploring the the mercy of God that extend to Jew and Gentile alike. And in the chapter, chapters before that, he described the heart of the gospel. Again, the mercy, the love of God, the love from which nothing can separate us. And then at chapter 12, he starts to come to our response to that love of God. What do we do? in return for that amazing grace. And he describes this this offering of worship in our lives. And we're going to hear that reading uh, recorded by Ali Wheeler from her home. But first, let's hear the psalm. The first reading is from Psalms, Psalm 138, and I'm reading from the Good News Version. I thank you, Lord, with all my heart. I sing praise to you before the gods. I face your holy temple, bow down and praise your name, because of your constant love and faithfulness, because you have shown that your name and your commands are supreme. You answered me when I called you with your strength, and you strengthened me. All the kings in the world will praise you, Lord, because they have heard your promises. They will sing about what you have done and about your great glory. Even though you are so high above, you care for the lowly, and the proud cannot hide from you. When I am surrounded by troubles, you keep me safe. You oppose my angry enemies and save me by your power. You will do everything you have promised. Lord, your love is eternal. Complete the work that you have begun. The reading is taken from Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Thanks be to God. God of all life 
speak to us now your word of grace and truth. Show us your good, pleasing and perfect will for our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our service this morning began as usual with what we describe as the call to worship. The call to worship. An invitation to worship the living God, to offer our worship, our praise. But what does worship really mean? Months of lockdown and restrictions have challenged us to think again. What does it mean to worship God? It's not been possible for us to meet together in the usual way. Some of us are here, many are at home. It's not possible to sing as a congregation, though there's beginning to be easing of that. We can have a small group singing, but not too loudly. I guess I could burst into song at this point, but I will save you that. It's been difficult to share communion. We did so uh, when we were all locked down in our homes, virtually connecting with my celebrating communion in my home. But the challenge of how we share communion both here and at home together uh, is still working through my mind and the mind of your elders. Not easy to do in a way that truly shows forth the love of God in bread and wine. And of course, we're not having tea and coffee, one of the essentials of Sunday worship in our nonconformist tradition. What does worship mean? We've been called to worship. But how? How do we worship? And what does that worship mean? For many religions in the past, it was about offering a sacrifice, a lamb or a pigeon or whatever, to placate the God who held life in the balance. Life was uncertain, life remains uncertain. And in those days it was seen particularly, life was so, so uncertain. God was uncertain and potentially dangerous. A God to offer life and to take life away. And so worship was there to placate a potentially angry God. Life, offer a life, the blood of a lamb or a pigeon or whatever, and the God who held your life in his hand would be satisfied. And Paul knows all about that tradition of offering sacrifice, both within his Jewish background and in the pagan world that he is caught up in. And he takes that picture of sacrifice, but he turns it upside down. God has made the sacrifice. It's not our little sacrifices of innocent animals, but God has made the sacrifice in entering our human lives in Jesus, and in the, the giving of the life of Jesus on a cross. God, Paul says, shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died.
died for us. Christ died for us. And the world, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And so sacrifice has been turned totally upside down. It's not us trying to placate an angry God, but God reaching out and giving of the very self, the very heart of God in compassion and mercy and love and grace. God has made the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. And how are we to respond to that amazing love and compassion of God? Paul says, therefore, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. No longer about dragging in some poor old animal to be sacrificed. It is about our own sacrifice. But not in a deadly way, but in a living way. That's the, the irony, the paradox. It is a living sacrifice. An offering of life, not of death. How will we offer our lives to God today, wherever we are, and in the days ahead? I think that word therefore is so important. It's the hinge in this whole letter. Up to there, Paul has really been talking about all that God has done. This love of God in Christ that nothing in life or death, can separate us from. Nothing that life throws at us can separate us from that love of God. And God has done that not with our help, but simply through his action in Jesus. And therefore, we respond. If you receive that kind of love, and maybe we have glimpses of it in human love, where we find that real friendship and acceptance, and we can somehow breathe more easily. The mask that we wear can be removed, and we can be ourselves. We are accepted. Yes, we're imperfect, we're broken, and yet in that love and friendship, we can somehow be better. We can be more what we want to be, more what that person would hope us to be. And is that more, that breathing easy, that living better, living more true lives that is our offering of worship? In his exploration of worship, George Appleton quotes from a 9th century Muslim woman saint of the Sufi tradition who offered this prayer. My God, if I worship you in desire for heaven, exclude me from heaven. If I worship you for fear of hell, burn me in hell. But if I worship you for yourself alone, then do not withhold from me your eternal beauty. We worship God because God is worthy of worship. We don't worship God out of any ulterior motives. It's not a sacrifice to placate an angry God who might do something nasty to us. No, God's love is absolute and certain. We worship simply because God is worthy of our worship. God stirs up that worship within us. And how do we offer that worship? 
we offer it in our daily living. Paul talks of offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, flesh and blood. We often think of worship as a mental exercise, something that we think about. Or maybe we think of it as a very spiritual exercise about being caught up in the spirit. But Paul is saying, offer your bodies, these funny bodies with all their aches and pains and all the rest, all their growing or their shrinking, depending on our age. We offer our bodies, our very selves. That's what Paul is about. As one commentator says, True worship is the offering to God of one's body and all that one's body does every day. Real worship is not the offering to God of a liturgy, however noble, or a ritual, however magnificent. Real worship is offering of every day, everyday life to God. Not something transacted in a church, but something which sees the whole world as the temple of the living God. It's a living out of that prayer that Jesus gave us. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life, in your life. And that means standing up against the pressures that come from the world, as Paul describes it, those pressures that would turn us back from this love of God to our own selfish demands, this need to have it all, this need to dominate, this need to satisfy every pleasure, every whim. The world tries to conform us to this advert, you know, you're worth it, you must have that, you must have this. And the Spirit transforms us to recognise we have it all in the love and the mercy of God. And we do this not on our own, but together. We offer our bodies because we are part of the body, the body of Christ, each with our different gifts, each called to offer those gifts within the life and the worship of the body of Christ today. So often in this individual, individualistic society, we think we have to go it alone, but we're part of a community. Yes, our neighbourhoods, yes, our community uh, in the world, but also a community in Christ where we can encourage and help and journey together. And so Paul gives that list of different gifts that are used. And basically he's saying, get on with it. Don't hold those gifts back, but use them. Use them for each other, to encourage, to build up, to bless, to show the love of God God, to others. And to do so, he says, generously, generously, diligently, and cheerfully. And maybe those are good words to take into our lives this week, to live life generously, to live life diligently. We've seen a lot of carelessness in our society. But live life diligently and live life cheerfully. We're all sad at the moment because of Harry and our loss of Harry, one of our elders and friends. But Harry lived out that. He lived cheerfully. He lived diligently. He lived generously.
So we thank God for Harry and his example. And may we use our gifts as well and as fully as he did his gifts. We are pilgrims on a journey and companions on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load.